Thank you all for these two days. It's been, um, there's been a lot of information. I'm trying to compile everything. It's impossible. So what I'm going to suggest for you is um, to go on, um, uh, on YouTube and to go to the Creative Leadership Summit um, uh, site, and you'll have uh, all the videos of the conversation that have been held in the last uh, few hours and two days. A lot has been said, and I think that um, there's a few things. I come back to my first slide to remind you of where we started uh, two days ago, or yesterday, rather, and, um, and highlight a few points, again, that, um, that, I have, uh, uh, that I've ha highlighted uh, that are really very crucial to, to uh, remind ourselves. So if I look at the tax revenue, I'm back on the, the money side because I think that uh, out of everything that we've basically heard in the last two days, there is one thing that's very important is that you have to have enough money for innovation. You need to have enough money for environmental problems. You need to have enough money for security issue, for poverty, for everything. So it starts at a good, healthy economy will permit you to have a good, healthy world. So now we have Europe that's trembling. We have US that's trembling. The question is, you know, someone, someone sometimes asks me, Louise, where do you invest your money? Well, I invest in art, and I invest in real estate, and I'm so scared of the stock market. And I invest in myself, which is my business. Um, because I know about my business. I know the weaknesses and I know the strengths. So investing in the financial market is very difficult because you don't have the human being in front of you to be able to interview them to see where there are strengths and weaknesses as humans and as well as business people. So today, um, it's a big question. Where do you actually put your money? Where do you want to put your, 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 your risk? And um, so that question, if I ask most of you today, uh, you wouldn't be able to answer where, where do you actually uh, basically want to invest and what, what do you want to do in the next uh, four years and where are we going to be? Uh, we have uh, different panels that we've uh, had today, but the financial dis you know, crisis, uh, nobody agrees. <laughs> nobody agrees on where we should be going and where, what, where we are at today. So, um, so there's no crystal ball that's going to tell us uh, where to go, but there's one thing that's really crucial. Uh, and I go back to my example of running a company. The math has to work. You've got the revenues, and you've got the expenses, and you've got your capital expenditures, and you've got your balance sheet. So on your balance sheet, the debt level is very high, and you have to be able to pay your interest. So on the revenue side, if we look at where is the money coming from in this country, it is on individual income tax where you are, the percentage uh, of, uh, of, 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 of is about 53% that you're getting from the individual income tax, so which is a very high number. The second one is on social insurance at 29%. So if, if there's one thing that we really have to that comes out of a lot of the sessions that we've had in the last two days is really to look at small businesses, job creations. Job creations is maybe not everything, but I would say it's 90% of the solutions. It's not by increasing more ta the taxes. It, that's a band-aid. It doesn't make any sense to do that. It's job creation. 65% of the jobs are created by small businesses. That's it, it's simple. I don't know why actually we're not applying that. I don't understand the concept. I don't understand why uh, people are complicating themselves. And uh, how do you stimulate small businesses? You give them loans. You give tax credits, incentives for individual, for corporations. You repatriate the trillions of money that's outside of, these, of, the, of the United States. You get them to invest in small businesses. It's not complicated. So I don't understand why it can't be done. I, I, uh, maybe you have thoughts that you'd like to send to me, and we can convey it to um, authorities, and we can see 
What, what, what is it, what is it I, that I'm not getting? Why is it so complicated? I mean, if you're asking me to send a rocket to the moon, that is really complicated to me. But how to fix small businesses? Because I've started, I started a small business with four individuals, and I ended up with six, seven thousand, and uh, and now I'm back in the internet, and we have about seventy people or eighty people, and we have a lot of freelancers. But overall, I've been to all the different stages. I've been private, I've been public, and really a small business is where we increase the, the, the amount of jobs. So I don't really get it. Um, innovation is key. If you look at uh, the last two days, we spoke about innovation. Innovation is linked to basically everything. Innovation is, uh, lives in technology, in environment, uh, in, ter in terrorist understanding, in poverty, in finance, in everything. So the, uh, the idea is if innovation is very, very important, how, how do we make ourselves more innovative? I think how I evaluate a brain or a conversation or a corporation is by someone being able to link the different elements and to put them into context. So that means, what does that mean? That means that if you want to build a product, you need some marketing, finance, pro the product definition, the promotion, the distribution, all these elements together, and you then put them into a context. If you don't have a context, you don't have creativity. Same can be applied to everything, like art. You put different colors, different shapes, different uh, maybe different uh, materials that you use, and then you put it into context. But it's, it doesn't, an element cannot live alone. It has to do one plus one makes four, four plus three makes five, then you add it together and it makes a thousand. And that's when the concept is created. So the question to ourselves, which is very, very important, is how do you teach children to put the elements that relate to one another, that resonate together, and put it into context? So I think the best way to do that is to first, I go back to my development of senses. If you are going to teach a child a little psychology or a little um, idea about mathematics, why not take a painting? Why not teach him how to see and to look at colors and put colors into a context and put people in the room that you're looking at. Let's say that there's five people in that painting and they're all yelling at one another. They'll understand how the psychology of that, those people are interacting. They'll know uh, the context of the place. They'll understand more the space that they're living in on that canvas. So there's many ways through, through, um, through the images that are very important to, to convey and develop the senses, develop your eye, develop your ear, develop your touch, your smell, your taste, to then be innovative because it doesn't come by not feeling. Most of the things that I create, I don't create things that are very complicated, but I create. I always look at the world as a matrix. Actually, it was very interesting because as I was sitting down, I was saying to myself, how am I going to reconstruct my next product? And this is how I see, you probably can't see this, but this is how I see, I see in matrix. And then I start putting all the different elements together and I put them in a context. And they all sort of live together and then I create a product. This is how my mind works. So um, I don't say that that's the best way, but it's the way that works for me. But I think a lot of artists and developers, that's how they do it. So innovation, I think, if we come out of these two days with 
one important point, it is, um, or a few points, innovation, partnerships. Partnership is very important. Partnership from the government point of view. If you look at governments and environment and scientists, and uh, I think it's very important for them to work more as a partnership as a business, as we would run, if we, if, if you're looking at environmental issues, you can't work with, not with the finance and budgets, you have to have budgets there, you have to have the understanding of the culture, you have to have the government, you have, really, it can't, if environmental issues are going to be dealt with, they need to be dealt with, with ma major players at, uh, together, united, and thinking out of the box, and again, I come back to, with that innovation. And, and most innovation, a point that was made uh, as well in one of the sessions was that innovation, um, innovation doesn't just happen there on that moment. It's a cumulative of things and happenings. Like the, the, the printing plant just didn't happen. It was an evolution of activities that happened that brought the final printing plant. The fax machine, it sort of didn't really happen. I remember getting my first fax machine. Uh, that was how many years ago? Let me see, probably at the birth of Alexandra. Yes, my daughter, that's right here. And she's 24. So 24 years ago, the fax came out. My problem was I was the only one to have one, or I couldn't send anything to anyone. So, I mean, it's, that's the problem. So most of the things that happen take a long time to come in and be accepted. I mean, maybe the phone was different, because the phone, I remember phones that were this big, and I'm not, I mean, I'm, I'm old, but not that old, and, 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 and then the phone picked up. That came, that got picked up much quickly. That it was, it was much quicker. Um, but the fax was, took a little while. And, uh, and the computers, the internet, that was painful for me. Because I started hiding away, because nobody believed in it. In 1992, 93, I was trying to put 18 million items that I had for sale, like eBay across the world, on, on, on the internet. And nobody understood it. But my worst thing was that I couldn't actually, once I had the computer and I had built all the sites, because by then I had built 60 sites, I forgot about one thing, that my customers, actually my advertisers, didn't have a computer. So I mean, that's how it works. So today we have financial crisis. We're in it for a little while. And it's going to take us a long time to get out. Sometimes it just, you have to be a little bit patient. But it's very important to keep in mind that with the income statement that we have, that it's very difficult to make it. However, I'm sure that they're going to come up with many budgets. And they're going to figure it out themselves. But we'll, we'll help them by, with, uh, with a few notes. And all your comments that you've made in the last few days will be conveyed as well to some governmental officials. But if you look at the total revenues, if you look again at 2020, they are predicting five trillion of expenses. And the revenues that were on the other page are, um, are at, uh, let me go back. The, and the revenues that they're expecting in 2020 is 4.7 trillion. So they're spending, even if the risk of making it is at 90% of failure. And that's where the model doesn't work. And again, the only way is through innovation, through individual income tax, which is generated by jobs. So we spoke about, um, innovation. We spoke about social entrepreneurship, which is very important to, um, to be able to, the need to educate about social entrepreneurship is crucial, very important. That's the partnership that I was talking about. 
We spoke as well about security and law. Well, I'm not an expert in that uh, domain, but um, I think that in terms of uh, security, security is a major concern to all of us in terms of the political, uh, political cost that it comes, comes about with our individual safety. But again, as well, security costs a lot of money. If you look at the defense, uh, the defense uh, line, uh, you have about, you have a budget. It is budgeted that defense will be at 851 billion. That's in 2020. And this is compared to 295 billion in the year 2000. And that is a percentage of 16.5%. But the percentage increase from 2000 to 2020 on defense is 183%. It's enormous, enormous. So yes, we want security, but at what cost? So maybe we should have a referendum about that. So we should have a referendum about do we want to increase defense 188% to the detriment of education, to the detriment of partnerships and small businesses and job creation. These are important questions. And I think if we had a board meeting and we had a few shareholders, they would definitely say to us, um, cut defense <laughs> and let's invest in jobs and let's go and invest in, um, in job creation and give a tax incentive to the small businesses. Small businesses today cannot get bank loans. Who's talking about that? Can't get bank loans. The bank will say, we want a personal guarantee. And if you can't give a personal guarantee, they'll say, well, I'll lend you one dollar for a dollar. That's what they're saying to banks right now. And then they say, well, I'm getting cheap money because the interest rates are, are very low, but your spread has to be at least three to four percent. And that's a good deal. So in other words, the governments are lowering the interest rates, but not the banks. The banks are making the biggest spreads. So if the banks are not lending, we've got to find a way very quickly to go and get tax incentives for individuals so I'd rather see, instead of, of, of making and putting more tax on the people that are wealthy, why don't do this? Why don't put an incentive for them to go and invest and get a tax break for 75% to go into an investment with a small business? And depending on the risk, you can have a 50% tax break or a 75% tax break. That creates jobs and it creates the job of tomorrow. Because what I'm worried about is that right now, the small businesses, can't, they cannot get loans since 2008 or nine. They don't have any more backlog. So that means that we're late. We've been late now a few years in terms of creation of jobs. So we have to catch up because a small business doesn't become middle, middle size overnight. It takes time for it to grow. So, so that looks more gloomy. So really what is very important is to get the cash, get the trillion that's sitting outside of, of the United States, get it back in, repatriate that money, give a tax incentive, go invest in your small businesses. That's all I can say. We spoke about culture beyond borders. As you know, my heart is in, um, is in the arts. Um, and I guess I saw a market that was completely fragmented. And I think what interests me about the arts was, well, my father, when he was studying law, was an impresario, so I was very influenced by, by that. And my mother uh, dragged me when I was a little girl uh, to every single museum. Um, but apart from that, uh, which, I was, which I'm, I'm very pleased uh, to have done, um, but apart from that, I've been traveling for about 25 years because I had a business around the world. And, um, and I always 
came across, and that's what Lex was, was saying, Lex uh, Fenwick from Bloomberg, I ca came across clashes, cultural clashes everywhere. I mean, you, have, you cannot put a French person, uh, CEO, in, in Thailand. It just doesn't work. Uh, you don't want to put, uh, and, and then the other thing is that you have different recipes uh, of success uh, in different countries. So we're, we're, we're much more local and more so than we think we are global. And what's interesting is that when you want to open a bank account, let's say with UBS or Credit Suisse, uh, and if you're not American, what you have to go through today is a nightmare. They won't even send the people that are in your accounting a calculator to have access to your account if you have to delegate that function. They cannot send documents from Switzerland to America directly. So it's very interesting. So we're saying, and then we say that accountant firms are really international, but really they're all lawyers because they're all local because they're all partnerships. Lawyers are the same. So as a global company, you end up putting all the pieces together. You still have to do that because there's no global platform that really offers you all the services. So cultural beyond borders for us has different meanings. For me, cultural, beyond border has the meaning of dialogue, get an education, um, get to know your, uh, your partners, your global partners. Uh, for political reasons, you have to have allies because you can't pay that defense bill anymore alone. So you have to make friends. As a business, I think on cultural dialogue, what's important really is to get to understand your people, and on the educational side, is really to get to know your 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 neighbors by going to um, by by the arts. The arts is a good way for children and for all of us to know what's going on in a country. When I go to a country, I don't go see politicians first. Those are the last people I'm going to go see. The first people I go see are the artists, because I'm going to get the temperature. I get the temperature through the artists, then I'll go see the business people, and then I'll go see the politicians. And then I'll be able to make my own sort of, um, uh, and that's what I did in Mumbai, the last time I was in Mumbai, and it's very revealing. But anyway, art is, um, is a way to, uh, it gives you a way to express yourself, and it helps you uh, understand the, um, uh, through the music or through visual arts, it, it helps you understand your neighbor, and it's a soft way for diplomacy. It's not intrusive. Everybody wants to have a, to learn about the music of another country, and it's very, and you learn so much from it. So much more of that can, can happen. And as well, a great example of that and, um, is, uh, is the Guggenheim in Bilbao. There was a lot of conflict with the Basque and, uh, and, and the Spanish people. And they, they had riots and conflicts and violence. And when Bilbao, when the Guggenheim, uh, that was the Tom Krenz uh, created that with his team, um, and he, he imagined that it would be a good idea to have a museum right there. I mean, right there in a place where nobody would go. And now it's booming. So just putting great architecture brings happiness, brings tourists from all over the world, and it's created a new platform. So I'm completely for services and development of our country, but as well culture and tourism is wonderful. And it brings happiness, not only good economy, but happiness. I can't go through exactly all what has been talked about, but um, I want to thank you all for being here, for your contribution, and uh, any ideas that you have, uh, and I'm sure you have many, don't hesitate to email us. Uh, anyone that you want to invite uh, that you think would contribute to our think tank um, is very welcome. 
It's not a place like other places, and I never wanted to be like other places because I usually never construct things that are like others. Because I think that my idea is, and maybe I didn't want to sound arrogant, but uh, I'm bored with a lot of discussion in our world. And when I read the newspapers, I'm even more bored sometimes. So um, I said to myself, why don't we bring out uh, people that are very smart, that work all day, that don't have the opportunity of meeting a lot of people, and why not engage a lot of the academics, which is the, one of the greatest asset of America and, and other countries, and why don't we engage them in a conversation with, uh, with their own discipline? Because in a university like Harvard, the scientists don't speak to the lawyers and the legal department doesn't speak with the business department. They don't even speak to one another. When they come here, they, they actually meet each other and have a conversation. So one of the greatest assets is in the universities, and it, it's a great pleasure to have a lot of academics with us and as well entrepreneurs, and mixing really the science with the, the, the historians and the politician, and it's very engaging. For example, the president of Iceland has devoted a lot of his career on environment. He's been, a, he's been pushing uh, that, uh, uh, that uh, the, the, the environmental issue. So he's very pleased to be able to engage in conversation with other scientists and, uh, and, and then give projects to them and work with them and, and look at different, um, different opportunities that he can bring other ideas as well to other presidents and prime minister and engage in another conversation about the environment. So it's a, it's, um, a contagious uh, effect to gather people like you and, um, and I'm very thankful for your contribution and have a lovely evening. Goodbye.